Well, uh, Mr. President, as I just told you, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you at E3. Uh, it's uh, not the first time we have a chance to welcome uh, head of the head of state of, uh, of Iraq. Don't be frightened. Last time it was not Saddam Hussein. <laughs> uh, it was uh, President Talabani, uh, who also was a very, very close friend of uh, President Saleh. And uh, we also had the chance to welcome, uh, I think, your current uh, prime minister. And uh, over the years, we had very good, uh, very good Iraqi friends at uh, IFRI. By the way, at the time of Saddam Hussein, I didn't tell you that, but uh, I had observed, you, you had quite good ambassadors. Uh, I mean, the Saddam Hussein had uh, sometimes quite good ambassadors. The, 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 the curious point was that all of them were chemists. So there is a big uh, historical question, you know, why were the main diplomats of Iraq at the time of Saddam, why were they chemists? Well, I leave that question open because we have other questions to discuss uh, this morning. President Saleh was elected, if I am not mistaken, the 2nd of October, 2nd of last year. So you have been uh, in office for about five months uh, now. And um, I uh, think, according to what I have heard and read, that you have already uh, achieved uh, a number of significant steps uh, which uh, go in uh, the direction which is uh, your main mission, which is how to achieve uh, unity, the better unity of your country, uh, even recognizing that it is not, uh, it will never be, as you just told me, a uh, country of the sort of uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, model. So thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> President. The uh, title of your speech you are going to deliver now is uh, after Daesh, uh, or Daesh, uh, uh, a new Iraq. So we are going to listen to you with great uh, attention and interest, and uh, thank you also for uh, accepting to have a very open uh, discussion uh, after that. Mr. <coughs> President, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for offering me this opportunity and uh, uh, that you remind me that President Talabani was here. He was my mentor, and I worked very closely with him over the years. One of the things he would often remind me of is the importance of France, the importance of the culture of France, and the significance of France to our part of the world. <coughs> so I'm happy to come here after so many years, after Mr. Talabani has delivered his uh, conversation uh, to this audience. I come to you, ladies and gentlemen, at what I consider to be a very important moment in history, not just for Iraq, but I would say for the entire Middle East. As the title of the uh, talk today uh, states, uh, many of us are talking of the period after ISIS. For sure, ISIS has been defeated militarily, and the territorial defeat of ISIS has been a, an important, significant <coughs> success for Iraq and for the international community. A few years back, ISIS was in control of one-third of Iraq's territory, controlling major cities of Iraq, terrorizing the population of Iraq, Syria, uh, the wider neighborhood, and in many, many cases, the rest of the world. At that time, many speculated about the demise of the Iraqi state. Many speculated about the end of Iraq. Today, we are witnessing the end of the caliphate. We're witnessing the end of ISIS control over the territories. I want to remind that this was no easy victory. This was a tough battle. Iraqis paid it dearly. Iraqis suffered along the process. Many of Iraq's community, and for that matter, Syrian communities have suffered a terrible ordeal at the hands of these ISIS extremists. This success, again, was 
uh, made because of the sacrifices of Iraqi forces, military, as well as the population. It came, Iraqis from different backgrounds came together. Arabs, Kurds, Shias, Sunnis, Turkmen's, all the communities of Iraq, Iraqi military, police, Peshmerga, Hashd al-Shaabi, and they delivered together a very important and profound success. But this success would not have been possible without the support of the international community, without the support of the international coalition and our neighbors who came to help us. In this context, I want to appreciate and recognize the contribution that France has made to the international coalition. This is much appreciated and we are grateful for the help. I want to emphasize that no one should take away from the significance of the moment in terms of the victory achieved over ISIS. Soon we may end the last remaining pocket. By the we, I mean collectively, uh, the last remaining pocket controlled by ISIS in Syria, and we may declare the end of the caliphate. How no matter how important this success is, and again, we should not underestimate its significance, but I want to caution, this is no, not the end of extremism, and this is not the end of terrorism that we have witnessed in the past. We have been through this phase before. When victory is declared too soon, only to be revisited by another manifestation of these terrorist groups, so, while we recognize the importance of this moment, a message of caution. Mission is yet to be accomplished. There is a lot more that needs to be done, and we need to address the root causes that allows for such extremist groups to flourish and terrorize populations in the Middle East as well as the international community. Certainly, Fixing the situation in Iraq will be important. By fixing, I th by that I mean we need to embark, and we have already started, on major political initiatives to make sure that our communities are fully represented within our system, encourage political reconciliation, bring together the moderates from across Iraq in the face of extremes. This will be primarily an Iraqi process it will be done with difficulty. Some of these difficulties of the past will not be overcome easily, but nevertheless, we have to do it. The omen are overwhelmingly positive and encouraging. The transfer of power, despite the odds in Baghdad, despite the difficulties in Iraq, has been remarkable. Relations between Baghdad and Erbil has improved significantly. And we hope that we can build on the good ambience uh, with the new government so that we can really address some of the constitutional requirements to put this relationship to a lasting and enduring uh, solution. This is not to say that Iraq's problems are only defined by these issues. We are a country that have emerged, is emerging from decades of conflict, dictatorship, war, sanctions, and we will need time in order to address these political concerns. Politics is important, but I would say what is true in France, what is true to the United States, what is true in so many other countries is also important to Iraq. The economy, jobs, creating job opportunities for our young, uh, creating uh, an environment that can allow our growing population to be productive and to be part of a prosperous economy. This is easier said than done. Iraq has been a rentier state for decades, and in the context of a democratic or quasi-democratic system of government, it's not very easy to push through the structural economic reforms that are needed in order to deal with the kind of requirements we have. Iraq is definitely in doubt with significant uh, natural resources, water, agricultural land, antiquities and tourism, including religious tourist sites, 
and it also has a, an industrious population and an active population. These can offer Iraq a way forward and moving out beyond what we have known to be a terrible rentier state. But we also, on the other side, we have a large population, 38 million people, with one increasing by one million every year. 70% of our population is below the age of 30. They are demanding jobs and are expecting jobs. And this is a huge challenge. And as I said, as it is true in your country, it is true to us as well. How to really embark on what is most important to people. Good quality of life with decent opportunities for our young people to create jobs. This is the bigger challenge that is before us to make ensure that extremism and terrorism will not flourish again. Our government, our new government led by uh, Dr. Adel Abdel Mahdi, who is an economist educated in France, is very much focused on this as a priority. But the task ahead of us is going to be uh, monumental. And there will be some tough choices that we will have to do in order to deal with this, while we also have to deal with the imperative of reconstruction of the destroyed villages and cities and towns and allow for the repatriation of our displaced population. These are difficult challenges anywhere in the world, but in the context of Iraq and the legacy of troubles that we have, this has to be really uh, appreciated and in terms of the monumental challenge that we will have to deal with. Iraqis and the Iraqi leadership will have a lot of responsibilities placed upon our shoulders to do the right thing. This will not be a linear uh, process. This will not all be uh, from a success to a success. We will be bumping along uh, through political and other impediments like corruption, which is a huge problem for our societies, not just in Iraq, but across that neighborhood. And it has cre been created by the political economy of conflict and uh, chaos that these terrorist groups have uh, done. But we have to do it. And we will have to have a medium long term strategy in order to deal with those. But this will not be enough because Iraq is not an island in the Pacific. Iraq is part of that tough neighborhood that we live in. The outcome of the regional dynamics will have huge consequence to both the issue of extremism and terrorism, but also to Iraq's stability and its future. The conflict in Syria has gone on for far too long, while we uh, are hopeful that the large, the last remaining pocket of ISIS control will be finished before long, but there are much more uh, that needs to be done, particularly dealing with some of those extremist elements that continue to be there as a threat for now as well as for the future. Time that the international community and the neighborhood get together to really end this conflict in Syria and provide the path for a political settlement that will respect the will of the Syrian uh, people at the end of the day, but focus primarily on ending this terrorist scourge that has proven such a terrible threat to both Syria, Iraq, and indeed Nabal. One of the other dynamics of which Syria and perhaps Iraq uh, has been a symptom of is of this regional rivalry that has been going on for decades. I may sound like a dreamer, perhaps I am, but uh, this neighborhood has gone on. This conflict in the neighborhood of the Middle East has gone on for too long, but I dare say they are the conflict in the region are not as difficult as those conflicts that have beset Europe in the 18th, 19th, and the 20th century. You manage to overcome them. You manage to move beyond them after two devastating world wars in uh, Europe. You manage to create an economic union, creating a lot of common interests between your nations and your states, notwithstanding the debate over Brexit. But this is quite a significant development and change of course of history. The conflicts in the Middle East 
while the rhetoric might have been a lot tougher because we are known to be using colorful language and, and a lot of rhetoric. But compared to the devastation and the difficulties of two world wars in the 20th century, probably is not as bad as, as those conflicts. This part of the world remains to be the last broken region in the world. If you compare it to Europe, if you compare it to East Asia, if you compare it to Latin America, even if you compare it to Southern Africa, is at least among the last remaining regions that needs a new order that is based on common interests between the nations and states of that part of the world. I also dare say, if you look at the contemporary history of the Middle East, the last four decades at least, one of the region of one of the reasons for this regional conflicts and uh, tensions, or one of the manifestations, would be the fact that Iraq has been absent from this neighborhood. Iraq has been the zone in which many conflicts have been decided and fought out. Iraq has been part of those conflicts. After four decades of wars, sanctions, terrorism, isolation, many Iraqis are coming to the conclusion it is enough. Instead of Iraq being the zone in which these conflicts are fought, in which Iraq is becoming the eastern gate of the Arab world, of the western gate of uh, others, Iraq should be the place where the interests of our neighbors could come together. I visited together with my colleagues, most of our neighbors, in fact, all except for Syria. We visited Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Emirates, uh, Qatar, Jordan, and come yesterday from Egypt. I don't want to be too simplistic about it. Obviously, many of these nations <coughs> have different views about what they want in Iraq and what they s seek in the neighborhood. But I would say the notion of combating extremism, no matter how loosely that is defined, defining a new regional order based on certain principles, including the stability of Iraq, is a theme that is emerging more and more. I don't want to get too excited. It's a lot of work ahead of us. But I would say the geopolitical position of Iraq, the resources of Iraq, the consequence of Iraq to regional balance may offer us that role where it could be the catalyst of a different regional order. I know there are different forces that may work against that vision, but the Prime Minister and I and my colleagues in the Iraqi government, the senior Iraqi leadership, we want to pursue a balanced regional policy. We should definitely say Iraq first, we do not want our resources and we do not want our people to become embroiled in other people's conflict and create an environment in which hopefully a regional order can come through. Imagine railway systems going from the Gulf to Europe. Imagine pipeline systems and export facilities that can be, will have to go uh, uh, through Iraq. Imagine a, a different dynamics in Iraq in which we could become the bridge of interest of these uh, different <coughs> actors in the neighborhood together with the international community. This is obviously more of a vision, more of a dream. Practicality means we need to pursue a, uh, our priorities right. Our priorities is reconstruction in Iraq. Is our priorities is keeping Iraq off the conflicts that are raging through the region and try to be as focused as we can on our vital interests of recovering from the decades of conflicts that I have talked about. In this context, my appeal uh, to friends in the international community and certainly France in the forefront of that, we need your engagement. 
we need your support because this is can be the catalyst of changing the dynamics of what we have witnessed. We don't need to go back into the same cycle. One extremist group defeated, and we all pack our bags and leave and feel good, only to wake up in the morning and find another mutant that can come and terrorize us and uh, afflict our peoples and our security with the challenges that we have witnessed in the past. This is a moment should be cherished, the success against ISIS, but don't take it for granted. Iraq's success is real, but must be protected, must be nurtured, and again, must not be taken for granted. With that, I end, and I welcome your questions and your engagements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That's an extremely clear, uh, lucid uh, presentation that you just made. We have uh, about one hour, so we can have a really rich uh, discussion. And I would uh, like to encourage all of you to uh, intervene. And we, we have time to, to do so. Um, le let me uh, ask you to start uh, to comment a little further on your foreign policy. Well, uh, on two things, actually. Uh, I am, uh, uh, you know, over the last uh, 46 uh, years, the last 46 years, I have been very much involved in foreign affairs. And uh, one of the things I have learned is that uh, more and more domestic affairs and foreign, aff and, uh, and foreign policy are uh, more and more intertwined. You know, it's very difficult, especially nowadays, it's even more difficult than before, to separate entirely domestic politics and, uh, and, and, and foreign politics. So uh, it seems to me that this uh, should apply to uh, your country. And in, in that respect, uh, may I ask you to comment a little bit further <coughs> on your relations with, uh, for instance, uh, Iran, Turkey, uh, Qatar on one side, and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Emirates, Egypt, uh, Kuwait, uh, on, on the other hand. So uh, how, uh, especially Iran, of course, uh, I, I had observed that during the so-called Iran-Iraq war, that whenever one of the two countries seemed to win over the other one, there was a kind of reaction uh, to push back to equilibrium. This, of course, was to some extent related to the realist, uh, realistic policies of, of the West and, and the Soviet Union at the time, but also I think it was the beginning of, of the realization of uh, Iraqi uh, national feeling uh, because uh, for, for obvious reasons, I mean, but those who have studied these things a little bit understand wha what I mean. So uh, could you clarify that uh, a, a little bit? Uh, I'm sure that you do not want to have enemies today. <laughs> you cannot offer you that uh, luxury, but is it possible to avoid that? So how do you balance uh, your foreign uh, relations? And, uh, and also could you comment uh, a little bit further on how you see the future of Syria? Uh, which is uh, certainly not an easy, uh, an easy issue. And we, I should not forget uh, also the, the United States of America. And maybe Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe China. <laughs> Sir, obviously all politics is local. So and I agree with you that uh, increasingly you simply cannot disassociate uh, your foreign policy from the domestic politics. I emphasize domestic policy, uh, uh, policy requirements of Iraqis reconstruction stability. And more and more Iraqis from different backgrounds, Kurds, Arabs, Shias, Sunnis, Turkmen's, whomever, have come to the realization enough is enough. 
and that the priority should be Iraq's reconstruction, Iraq's uh, revival. And uh, we simply cannot afford to go on like what we have before. So part of this foreign policy outlook that I have presented to you today is a reflection of that understanding. Uh, the question is that our priority should be Iraq first, Iraq's independence, Iraq's economic and security interest. We do not pose a threat to others. Uh, we should not, we could not, and we should not be party to that. And we have tried it before. History of Iraq has chosen that, has seen episodes of that. And at the end of the day, uh, we were the country that has lost most after that. We are a 38 million population, as I said, one million increasing every year. Today, the statistics of our government uh, tells me that we need 12,000 new school buildings. That is the priority. This is the domestic politics, of course. There are extremists in, the, in our ranks who would say, you know, we need to go on this and that agenda and et cetera and so on. But I think the bulk of the Iraqi population and also, to be fair, the uh, main axis of present polity of Iraq is, is saying that. Again, this will not be entirely up to us because others are actors in this game in this neighborhood and I'm not naive about it. But we have to be very careful and be very guarding of that uh, principle. I can assure you that during our visits to all our neighbors, we spoke exactly the same language. Iran is a neighbor of ours. We have 1,400 kilometers of borders with Iraq. It's not a matter of uh, you know intellectual exercise about uh, this reality. It is my reality, 1,400 kilometers of borders with Iraq. And I have security, I have political, I have cultural ties that I have to be respectful of and understand. It is in the interest of Iraq to have good relations with Iran. Yes, based on mutual interests, yes, based on respecting Iraqi sovereignty, yes, based on a variety of things for both sides. And we, we've said this well in Tehran and we did not get pushbacks. And I'm not saying that if I were an Iranian and look back at my history of Iraq relations, uh, this is not easily accepted necessarily by all Iranian officials. I mean, there is a lot of history to this relationship. With Turkey, the same message. We have many issues of water, security, politics, concern about the Kurdish situations, etc. you name it. But we need to have this debate. Either we are caught in that corner forever where we deal with this or we have a real different conversation. In Saudi Arabia, we met yesterday with the king of Saudi Arabia. And also during our visit there, we had very substantive conversations. And we said there, we cannot be expected and Iraq will not be party to an anti-Axis group in terms of being anti-Iran or anti-Saudi Arabia. This is not in our interest. Nobody expects us to do that. But everybody wants Iraq not to be a place where enmity could emanate from to them. That is in our interest to prevent our country to be a staging post to any attacks against our neighbors and by uh, also definition we expect them to be respectful of our interests and so on. Again, sir, I'm not saying given the history of the Middle East, given the dynamics, given the domestic politics, this is easily achieved. But we can work on it, we can build on it, and the key to it is improving Iraq's stability, political inclusiveness, and reconstruction and improving our own self-reliance. Iraq is coming out of this war with ISIS, more confident, more assertive about its own national interest. I, I'm saying in terms of our relations with our neighbors, this is how we see our own national interest, is not what others are telling us. And again, how we manage it, this will not be entirely up to us, this will be also up to our neighbors, in some ways up to the international community about they, how they will deal with this <coughs> emerging reality of Iraq and whether they can help this success to be nurtured and enhanced. On the issue of Syria, Syria is a terrible pain and a uh, humanitarian catastrophe 
of monumental historic proportions. There is, when you look back eight years now of this conflict, um, the billions of dollars that were spent in, on this senseless conflict, the hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced, the terrible, terrible humanitarian cost of this conflict, one million Syrian children born in refugee camps, and what is the outcome? We are a lot, a lot worse off than when this started. I do see a lot of realism emerging in the neighborhood about the situation in Syria. There needs to be a political solution, and we have to deal with the realities and push an agenda of political settlement by the Syrians that is respectful of the wish of the Syrian people. The continuing, you know, uh, regional and for that matter on occasions international uh, uh, playing with this is dangerous and I uh, will explain to you why. While ISIS again may be uh, thrown out in terms of territory very soon, but you have many, many extremist groups that are uh, prevalent in many areas, many pockets in Syria, and they continue to pose a potent threat to Syria, to Iraq, and I dare say to Europe and the Western world too as well. This is not to be feeling good about that, you know, conflict has subsided. There is no solution yet in Syria, and we really need to push hard. Iraq is becoming much more involved with this. We are talking to our neighbors. We're talking uh, to all of our neighbors about Syria. Uh, we should, as a neighborhood, together with the help of the Arab international partners, really push for a domestic political solution. The, and uh, I say probably, and our foreign minister here may be a bit off cuff, but the time lost on the formation of this constitutional committee and that while people are suffering and so on needs to be revisited. We need to have practical solutions in Syria. Practical solutions, the sooner the better for all of us. And seriously, time has come up for the plight of the Syrian people to be a priority for them to, you know, this, this senseless conflict to be ended. I don't have an easy solution after billions, billions of dollars that were spent on a senseless war, senseless conflict, and ending up with a lot of wars, ending up with ISIS, ending up with all these extremist groups, the Nusras, the Harar al-Sham, whomever they are, that are gonna be huge problems for all of us to deal with. So the Europe and the US and Russia? Wallahi, the U.S. and the Russia, I want you to tell me, obviously, the Americans are key players, undeniably so, but increasingly we are seeing the Russian role in Syria becoming far more present, and the Russians and Iraq, Iraq are talking. Iraq too? There is quite an engagement of Russia, and uh, we recently had, uh, uh, our foreign minister was in Moscow, I met with Mr. Lavrov, I met with Mr. Lavrov in, uh, was, uh, uh, in Italy we met, and uh, they send delegations that are becoming more active, involved. There is some security collaboration uh, because to them also this issue of extremist groups are also an issue. And certainly in Syria, as we can tell, that they are far more involved and they have far more uh, influence than, than before. The U.S. government has uh, announced that they will withdraw, but now they will retain 200 to 400 people according to news reports. Uh, but at the end of the day, I really, and I talk to our uh, American partners and uh, European partners about this, this really is time that we move beyond small pieces of this jigsaw, you know, uh, this tit for tat, we do this, we don't do that. This is a conflict has gone on for too long, too much money has been wasted, too many lives have been lost, too many people are growing up in refugee camps, it's a humanitarian calamity. But by the way, it is also a security threat because these are the incubators of extremism that will stay with us for a long time.
Thank you very much. So uh, now the floor is open. I will give uh, the floor first to Dorothee Schmidt from IFRI, and then Francis. Dorothee. Merci. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we're especially honored to host you at this time when uh, we feel that there is special momentum for Iraq. There is great enthusiasm. There are lots of expectations regarding um, the future of your country, uh, both uh, as a key piece in the uh, next architecture of the region, uh, but also internally, I think. You know that the French president dis de de designed, uh, uh, I mean, um, described Iraq as a pivotal state, uh, but he also referred in that matter at, uh, about the, at the, um, the internal structure of Iraq, its uh, constitutional uh, institutional system, uh, the political balance th that has proven uh, to emerge after the last elections, and Iraq has been pr presented as a sort of uh, a new democratic <laughs> success. So it seems that Iraq is now presented as a, um, a political model for the region in some way. And I would like you to maybe elaborate on the elements of this political success and what makes Iraq a potential model for other countries in the region. Wallahi, about the model, I think every country will probably have to go through its own transition. But Iraq, after decades of conflict, in my view, has a real chance at making it. Politics never ends. Politics will always be there, and new balances will re-emerge based on realities. But there is one thing for sure. The former prime minister is not in jail. The former prime minister is not executed. Definitely, the former president is not in jail. So uh, this is significant for our part of the world. It may sound tiny little, but uh, there is this orderly. Iraqis don't feel that it is so orderly, by the way. They want it to be far more uh, definitive. But there is, this is becoming a pattern, and people are getting accustomed to it. This is, a state is being built. There is one other aspect of Iraq which is significant, in my view. Iraq is a multi-communal state. You have different identities. You have Kurds, you have Arabs, you have Shias, you have Sunnis, you have Turkmen's, you have Yazidis, you have Christians, you name it. This is the reality of Iraq. Kurds remain to be proud of their Kurdish identity and heritage, including myself. I'm sure an Arab Shia likewise, and a Sunni likewise. But the people of Basra, are criticizing the Shia-led government because of lack of services, because of this, because of that. It's no longer defined by sectarian or ethnic politics. The people of Kurdistan demand the Kurdish-led government to do better, fight corruption, do this and do that. So the ethnic, the sectarian dimension of Iraqi politics has diminished in a significant way. I would say most Iraqis want jobs, want good services, want decent government, want law and order, and live in a decent way while we all celebrate our identities and so on. This is, in my view, a very significant statement about Iraq of today. I want to, uh, I referred this uh, to the president, this uh, President Macron today, I told him this, and I, I want to tell this audience too. Uh, on New Year's Eve in Baghdad, tens of thousands of people were out on the streets celebrating, and not a single security incident. Two weeks ago, the Minister of Culture and I opened the Baghdad Book Fair. Six hundred and fifty publishing houses, twenty-four countries, and I'm told two million people have visited so far, according to government statistics. That is, if you believe government statistics. So, I mean, 
but I think the numbers are right, by the way, because I mean, I was there, it was quite overwhelming what we saw. I think, that Mr. Ambassador, you and I were together with the minister at the opening of the uh, exhibition for, for Iraqi artists. There is a new normalcy coming back, okay? Again, this is not to say this is all clear picture, beautiful, or everything is hunky-dory. It is not. This is a country that is emerging from decades of conflict, ashes of war, is trying to make it. And therefore, I think the president is right. This is a country that holds promise. Uh, and in ironic way, the fact that we are no longer the headline uh, of newspapers bodes well that there is some normalcy returning back to this country. Message is success is real, precious, but not take it for granted. We need to nurture it. I understand, Mr. President, that the situation is better than with our yellow vest. And uh -huh. uh, maybe, maybe you discuss that with President I don't Macron. interfere <laughs> in the domestic affairs of France. You see what I mean? For sure. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, welcome to, to Paris. I'm uh, Louis Jap, the UK representative uh, in France. I want to just, you, you are president, and um, you are not only uh, um, a political actor, but a uh, technocratical actor. So I want to just to ask you about the economic uh, issues, economic problems in Iraq. Uh, do you have with the uh, Prime Minister, Iraqi Prime Minister, some plans about uh, economic future in Iraq? Thank you very much. As I said, our Prime Minister is very much focused on the issue of economic regeneration. He's, he's an economist by training. And I can tell you the following. He understands that uh, for Iraq to regenerate and creating the job requirements for our youth and creating the infrastructure that we need, we need to empower the private sector. But again, this is a very nice statement to make, but how to do it? Private sector empowerment needs legal protection, needs efficiency of government, needs ease of doing business, needs fighting corruption. So a lot of requirements for this. And to be fair, the government and the prime minister, led by the prime minister, is working on a number of these initiatives. They are working, and we have some ideas from the presidency that we offered to his office about the uh, reconstruction commission, about creating a board for reconstruction, uh, and particularly focus on issues of infrastructure, because infrastructure is what bring in jobs, and this is what Iraq needs, and this is what also is conducive to that model of regional order. We need to connect our economy to our neighbors, whether through railway systems, through highway systems, electricity grids, building airports, and Iraq will not be able to finance all of these things from its own immediate revenues. We will have to do uh, with in, in partnership with the private sector, and I know Today in the meeting with the president, there is a billion euros that is available for businesses uh, to be invested in Iraq and to be worked in Iraq. We look forward to partnership with important French companies that can come and help us with infrastructure. There are a number of ideas uh, that are being explored. The key is empowering the private sector. The state will have to continue to pay salaries, the bloated, uh, numbers of civil service employees that the state will have to keep on its payroll. This is a reality of it. But as you, the idea is that as you improve the private sector investment environment, more and more people will migrate to that and more and more job opportunities will be open. And uh, when you look at the numbers, the fundamentals of Iraq's economic future are very good. Our oil, uh, uh, Reserves are quite, quite significant. Gas discoveries have been taking place and many countries are more interested in this. Uh, now, more and more focus is on agriculture and reclamation of land. Uh, hopefully we have an agreement or at least uh, the elements of understanding with Turkey that will help us with the issue of water. Uh, 
that can help us revive our agra agrarian uh, economy, certainly in the south and, and, and uh, in the Nainawa Plains. So a number of these initiatives are on the way, but all these requires <coughs> stability and security, and I hope we can do those. Thank you very much. Après la dame, voilà. Moi, je prends dans l'ordre d'arrivée. Avancez, 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 reculez plutôt. C'est pareil. Voilà. <laughs> so you understand French. I, I can tell <laughs> you have a problem selecting. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Thank, Forward thank and backward, you know, ouais. is a very relative matter. Sure. So they, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. To President. Talk about, to speak, to talk about the Christians. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in Aramaic. Um, uh, my question about just uh, my question about uh, the minority. I'm I'm Iraqi. I'm uh, from the uh, Christian community in Iraq. Where do you come from? I'm I I come from Karakosh. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and uh, we know we know what what. Uh, uh, the, the different community uh, suffered a lot, uh, especially Yazidi and Christian and other community. And uh, today, uh, the town and village of uh, uh, Nineveh Plain is very damaged, very destroyed. Uh, the infrastructure of uh, this town is completely destroyed. What, uh, what, which, uh, what uh, strategy do you have as a govern Iraqi government to uh, protect this uh, minority today in Iraq? Because this minority represent uh, the balance of all, all the uh, region. Thank you. Thank you. I would take exception to the, f uh, what the term that you use, minorities. I really do, uh, genuinely so. Uh, you are an indigenous community of that part of the world, and you are definitely not a minority because that concept should not apply, whether to you, to the Yazidis, to the others. Uh, we talked about this today with, with the president as well, and I want to, with your permission, sir, to go a bit about it as well because this is significant. It is a bad thing to talk about this as Muslims versus Christians. And you know what I'm talking about, because ISIS and these extremists are a threat to Muslims as they are to Christians and to Yazidis. They use Islamic ideology to justify the abuse of Christians and abuse of Yazidis and other non-Muslim uh, communities, but they are truly an affront to Muslims in so many other ways as well. So this is fundamentally a debate by Muslims, should be led by Muslims, that these bigots, these extremists, these criminals are terrorizing these indigenous communities in the name of Islam. So Muslims should really lead that cultural and political debate about this matter. I want to say also in that context, Christians across the Middle East have suffered terribly. They have suffered attacks, onslaughts in Egypt, in Syria, and in Iraq. And uh, we as a state are bound to be attentive to the needs of the Christian community and the Yazidis and other communities that have suffered disproportionately during these matters. I want to assure you that uh, we are working on some of these issues. Today, for example, Nadia Murad, I call her my daughter, I, she uh, has become such a symbol for the plight of women, not just Yazidi girls and women, but uh, for, for all in, in so many ways. We are mindful of the security and the political issues that Christians in Nineveh Plains are dealing with. I was with Cardinal Sacco a week ago, 10 days ago, we sat down at length talking about some specific issues uh, on, on this matter, we're dealing with them. Sometimes there are excesses. Sometimes some of these excesses are to do with intercommunal things, not Muslim versus Christian, but sometimes a Christian would take 
charge of something that is not necessarily and is going uh, on behalf, you know, strengthened by some other political dynamics in the country to do things that are no good. Uh, I assure you that we as a government are going uh, uh, attentive to this matter and we're working with it and we're working with the church and other communal leaders uh, in order to deal with those. Uh, with the Yazidis, we still have a major problem of many of the Yazidi girls who are still in Syria and need to be returned back to their families. Our security services are pursuing this matter. Uh, but this is such a painful story, it's very difficult to elaborate further about it. Uh, reconstruction of Sinjar is needed, but this requires easing up the tensions in Sinjar. The government in Baghdad is talking to Erbil in order to allow that environment to happen. Uh, once again, on the Christians and other communities for that matter, both the Prime Minister and myself and the key players in the government are attentive to this, and uh, uh, it's an obligation, uh, constitutional, as well as moral obligation on our part to uh, address their concerns. It is awful, it's terrible that the extremists have managed to basically create an environment of exodus of many of these communities beyond their ancestral land. I mean, we all grew up with major Christian communities being part of the vibrance of our societies across the country, across Mesopotamia. So I hope that uh, with the end of the Khalifa, with the type of political and, and e economic issues that we're talking about, uh, we will be able to deliver on these assurances that are constitutional, that are practical to our communities in those neighborhoods. Uh, I happen to have discussed last uh, weekend in Munich with Cardinal Sacco, and uh, he told me that the situation is, is improving. Is it your perception? The uh, actually the the, um, the the Christian people uh, population is uh, uh, freedom from Daesh. It's it's good, but but I think today when we visit, for example, the 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 village or uh, the town of uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, town, it's very very uh, the, the the people suffer because we don't have the good. Uh, we don't have water. Uh, uh, but this is, my point is this, yeah. you're absolutely right, the reconstruction leaves a lot to, and to be fair, the church and the cardinal have done a good job in terms of bringing in reconstruction operations and so on, and to be fair to the cardinal, he has not just done it for the Christians, he's done some Muslim communities as well, and uh, I want to allude to that and appreciate that. But this is not because there are Christians that they have been denied, thousands upon thousands of Muslims, Sunnis, Kurds have been not able to go back to their homes because there are no services. And uh, uh, there was an interesting moment in Baghdad. This year, uh, uh, Christmas Mass, the Prime Minister of Vatican was in Baghdad. I had the honor of visiting the Pope in, in, in Rome, and we talked a lot about the importance of Christianity to our part of the world, to our culture, our heritage, our, and also, by the way, we spoke about Ur, and our Minister of Culture, he comes from that area, and he knows a lot about the history of that place. I was there a year ago, and I was amazed at what I saw. This is, where the, this is the place where uh, Abraham, Worship. This is where he started. This is where all the major religions came from. And I offered the hope, uh, the Pope, the invitation to come and visit, and to meet in the shadow of Ur, of the Zikrat in, in Ur, a meeting of all the major faiths that we should announce no more in our name, no more in the name of God, this senseless violence that is going on. This is not what Abraham wanted. So this is the history of that land, by the way. On Christmas Eve, I had the honor uh, and privilege 
of attending mass in Baghdad at the church. I was told I was the first Iraqi president to do so, and I hope I will not be the last, because that was quite a profound statement about the coexistence, about what Baghdad could mean in terms of a place of these different identities coming together. You have bigots, you have extremists, you have terrorists, but the overwhelming majority of the population, and you know, I think you would agree with me, overwhelming majority are of this tolerance, are of this openness, and have really, have lived together in, and coexisted peacefully together. Well, thank you very much. This is, I think, quite important, especially uh, discussing this in, in Paris. So now I think there were two more questions on this side. Monsieur Malbruno, Georges Malbruno, Le Figaro. Um, President uh, Saleh, um, I would like you to uh, come back to the issue of re-engagement of the Sunni, your Sunni neighbors, especially the Sunni monarchy. We've seen you've been to Saudi Arabia. There was some trip from Mokhtar al to Saudi Arabia. Some the UAE are uh, investing in, in, in Mosul. How do you assess the level of re-engagement now? And my second question also, just uh, referring to the, the minorities. Uh, in France, um, many politicians, NGOs are making a lot of noise in, in, uh, insisting on their help of minorities. Uh, I asked the question this afternoon at the press conference to President Macron, you've heard it. Uh, do you think this is the right approach towards Iraq to focus on minority? And did you tell President Macron your approach, which probably is not exactly the same? <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you what I told President Macron. That He's a good journalist. He's trying to fish out the information. Yes, I mean. <laughs> In terms of us, quote, Sunni neighbors, uh, that is a broad brush. These are states. These are countries that are intertwined and have an interconnected interest with Iraq. They have been affected by what's going on in Iraq, and we have been affected by it. I think they all share one thing. This is what the, it has been asserted to us. This has been affirmed to us. They don't want to see bad coming to them from Iraq. And we say we don't want bad coming from you to Iraq. And there is a lot of good that can come through trade, open relations, culture, uh, a lot of ties that have survived history. And we need to move beyond what happened. What Saddam Hussein has done uh, through invading Kuwait was no easy uh, task. I mean, the legacy of that conflict may have endured for a long, long time. I, the first place that I visited with my colleagues was to Kuwait, and we had a very substantive conversation with the Emir of Kuwait. And I was really uh, impressed and appreciative of his comments. He, he said, we don't want to leave these conflicts to future generations. We need to move beyond it. Let's work on overcoming. He's a wise man and cares about this relationship. And to be fair, there are political differences with some of these countries, some concerns, but we were very direct and very open with them. So to be very specific, uh, some may look at Iraq's relations with Iran as a problem to some of these countries. And this is the reality of Iraq, 1400 kilometers of borders, history, geography, culture, you name it. And when you talk about these things, so long as this is not aimed against them, so long as this is uh, in that context that we are saying, they cannot be but accepting of it in that context. And uh, I am hopeful, put it that way, I'm hopeful that we can uh, push through uh, important changes in that relationship. I visited Jordan. Uh, a while back, the Prime Minister of Jordan came to Baghdad, but we also had a very significant visit by the Jordanian King, King Abdullah, to Baghdad. This was the first Arab leader who would come to Baghdad after the formation of the new government. The Prime Minister personally went to the borders 
signed a series of agreements with Jordan on the establishment of a, a joint industrial zone, a lot of uh, removal of barriers of trade between Jordan and Iraq. We're doing a few of these things with the Kuwaitis. We're doing a lot with our neighbors, including Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia. The Saudis will be sending a delegation, I think in a couple of weeks' time, to come and visit to pursue some of these issues. But we do it with Iran, we do it with Turkey, because this is where our priority is. Yes, it is, this is the Middle East, the rhetoric, the passion is always there. But at the end of the day, seriously, like Europe, it is interest matters creating that dynamics, that uh, areas where you can find win-win solutions. But again, please don't think that I'm too optimistic and so on. I'm, I'm realistic, I've read history, I've seen this. But at the moment, given where Iraq is, Iraq could be the place where these actors can agree on a common theme. Stability of Iraq is vital to removing the scourge of terrorism and extremism that is a threat to all in different ways. And Iraq's economic revival could also mean creating the infrastructure links, the opportunities for all our neighbors. I dare say, and again, it is too ambitious perhaps, but if others could do it, other regions of the world could do it, Iraq can also be a catalyst for that change in our neighborhood. Uh, on the issue of minorities, and please, wallahi, I mean that. Please don't use the word minorities, because I used to be called a Kurdish minority, and it was so offensive to me. So my Christian friend there, I know how he feels. Don't, don't call these are communities that are indigenous in our part of the world. They are part and parcel. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. The language I'm telling you. And I tell you what, Christians will not be safe in Iraq or in Syria or in Egypt or across the Middle East unless you have stable, inclusive political orders that can address the fundamental rights of all these communities. You simply cannot create an enclave for this community and say they could be safe and we protect them and so on with the exclusion of the others. At the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we are part of that neighborhood. I'm a Kurd, proud of my culture, proud of my identity, and I can go on forever about the uh, terrible misdeeds that the Kurds have suffered. But the solution for our plight is to have a good deal in Baghdad, working out with the Arabs and creating a polity that can be respectful of my identity as a Kurd, but also respectful of the entire country. This is what can defeat extremism. This is what can address the interests of the various communities. That is why sometimes uh, being only focused in isolation on those communal rights, which is, I can understand why, but if it is too much in isolation of the realities, it could uh, mean you know, uh, negative consequences to all. Therefore, supporting this mission of a constitutional, institutional order that is protective of the rights of all, this is the right way forward. The, the achievement of your dream, Mr. President, uh, is uh, more or less comparable to the, and I am serious, to the construction of the European Union. Uh, it and may, it may it may take decades. It, it well, may like, succeed. Can I ask a question? Seriously, I want to have a debate, and if he could lead that debate, mm -hmm. if he no, seriously, look, I mean, I have read a bit. I'm not. I cannot say I'm that conversant with European history, but the world wars that took place here, devastating, mm -hmm. in in scale, and passion. No way can be compared to what we have. Obviously, Arab poetry, Kurdish poetry, Persian poetry are all very passionate and so on. But in reality, the scale of the conflicts that beset Europe was far more devastating than that in the Middle East. You change the dynamics by creating common interest. And I say to you, and I say to Europe, well, this is our priority. This is our vision. This is what we need. We may fail, 
we may not succeed. But wallahi, if I were a European leader and if I were an American leader, if I were a Russian leader, I would say this is in my damn interest. It will help me with this issue of extremism. It will help me with the issue of migration. And it will also create for me this major economic area that could be an economic partner to mine. So in a way, it is our priorities, our responsibility. And we may fail, but no more the failure in Iraq or Syria or any of these countries are just local. They are your problem too. And I'm telling you, I mean, I was talking about Basra the other day with a Gulf leader. I said, well, Basra is our second city, major city. It's an important uh, part. But God forbid if Basra goes bad and it's not going well, has not gone well for a while, needs to change it, the consequences are not just for Iraq and Baghdad. The consequences are for the entire neighborhood. So we really need to change the narrative and change the focus. And again, uh, please, uh, I go back and say, this will not easier said than done, but I think people are sick and tired of conflict in our part of the world. And I hope Europeans and Westerners are also sick and tired of playing power politics in that part of the world and at least learn from the latest episode of Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, that basically we all ended up with our hands burned. And Europe was not immune, America was not immune, Russia was not immune from the consequences of all of that. We truly live this in this interconnected world. I said in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, that the countries, the Arab world, the Middle East, and Europe are uh, Mediterranean countries, basin in a sense. That and the Gulf, these countries that surround the Gulf and the Mediterranean, can really come together. There are so many interests that combine these regions and really can change things. And again, could be a mere nice idea, but it is worth pursuing. Well, uh, uh, personally, I like very much this, um, the, your, your vision, uh, and of course the idea of changing the narrative is very important, but you use also another word, is the importance of having leaders who are leaders, I mean real leaders, and uh, that's a problem including in, in Europe, by the way. So, uh, but I think this is certainly the kind of vision that we should uh, try to share. So now we are going to move au Valais dans la dans l'allée là et la dame brune. Voilà. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Minutes. President, yeah. uh, many speculated about the so-called seeds of resentment seeds of resentment that are so deeply rooted, so deeply grounded, that uh, the problem will be difficult to overcome. Do you think, Mr. President, that this expression belongs to the past and is presently completely irrelevant? Thank you. Wallahi, <coughs> seeds of resentment. We all have our resentments, but I think really all people in America, in Europe, in Iraq, in Kurdistan, in Persia, in Turkey, in whatever you say, they all care about the same thing. Good schools for the kids, good jobs, Dignity, you know, really, at the end of the day when you, our cultures may be different, but the fundamental needs of humans, especially in this day and age with technology, with the global, globalization and so on, is the same. 
So I would say people have their resentments that they retain, but they also uh, look at what they have to offer their kids. Yep. And I want to build on that. And I think that is more uh, dominant uh, than resentments and seeds of resentment. So we have exactly, wait, wait a minute, we have exactly 10 minutes left. I tell you already, I tell you already that when the time comes to stop, we will of course applaud the president, but after that you will have to remain seated because it's not only a protocolary matter, it's a security matter. So you will please uh, sit uh, and, and wait before rushing uh, 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 outside. Monsieur Ploquin, an, another uh, in, uh, prominent journalist. Uh, thank you. Mr. President, um, during the last wor uh, years, uh, when we looked uh, at the Middle East, we, we analyzed it at, uh, a, 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 we've seen a big divide, a big conflict between Shias and Sunnis. I heard what you said, and you are in a, a very different vision. But what about the region? What about uh, the conflict or the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran? And during the last years, we had some, uh, we, we, we mentioned some kind of Shia crescent, you know, who, who went from Tehran to Baghdad, Damascus, Lebanon. Do you think, what do you think of this image? And what, as Baghdad was in that crescent, do you think that it's still a good image? Thank you. Uh, I think is really important to put things in historic context. Shia and Sunni divide in Islam in some ways is not a theological debate that we are witnessing today. today. There is politics to it. It's a political uh, tool that some players want to uh, mobilize people with. Example, Yemen. In the 1960s, Saudis were supporting the Zaydis, who are the precursors of the Houthis of today in some ways. While Egypt was supporting uh, the nationalists at the time. So to think of this as mere Shia Sunni divide, I think is fundamentally wrong. This is not to say there is not a Shia reality, there is no Sunni reality identity. Yes, there is. But it is not defined, uh, the it's not a theological struggle. And there are episodes in history that this rises, there are episodes that diminishes. I can tell you today in Iraq, people, I mean, when you see the Arba'iniyya of uh, the 40th day of Imam Hussein, you see millions of Shias pay homage to Karbala and express their uh, identity and do the pilgrim that they do. But I don't see this as being a political statement anti-Sunni per se. This, uh, under Saddam Hussein, they were denied the right to mourn Hussein. You see what I mean? That was a fundamental, I mean, just literally being able to cry for Hussein was denied under Saddam Hussein for a number of years. Uh, many Sunnis uh, who are Shafi'is consider themselves to be a lot closer to the Shias theologically and in terms of some of the practices. But let's not get into that. At the end of the day, what is defining our part of the world, and I try to be a student of history, it is there are three major power centers in that neighborhood. One is Anatolia, one is Persia, one is Arabia. And they have always been there in different manifestations and have, they have defined a regional order always in Mesopotamia. I mean, this goes 
predates, uh, given our Minister of Culture, who often tells me about history, goes back a long, long time. This is what it is. So to think of this as a mere uh, religious dimension, I think, is wrong. Furthermore, Iraq is unique in, in the following sense. You have Najaf in Iraq. Najaf is the preeminent center of Shia Islam. It's the Vatican of the Shia world. And nobody can take that fact away. So uh, I hope as we assess the dynamics of the Middle East and scratch a bit beyond the sectarian issues, uh, and, and see the realities for what they are. There is a lot more in, uh, enduring uh, uh, coexistence and peaceful coexistence among these communities than uh, sometimes uh, so-called experts make out to be. And it is part of a lack of a regional order that what we are witnessing. The Middle East is time to have a new order based on mutual uh, interest. We have had, for a period of time, I'll be blunt, Saddam Hussein as the guardian of the Eastern Gate in which a lot of Iraqis got killed. Iraqi treasure squandered, did not produce stability to anybody, ended up with a lot of conflicts. The vision that we have is an Iraq that is the interconnecting uh, domain for the interest of our neighborhood. And I'm sure Shias, Sunnis, Kurds, Arabs, Turkmen's, Yazidis, and Christians will all be benefiting if we succeed in that vision. Thank you very much. Mr. President and the Ambassador of Kuwait, once again, I welcome you here in Paris. Uh -huh. I, uh, I had the honor of meeting the Emir yesterday, actually. Yes, actually. Let me uh, extend uh, our deep appreciation for the level, uh, the high level and the advanced level that we have reached between Kuwait and uh, Iraq in our bilateral You know, as we have mentioned, you know, being victim by a number of uh, serious uh, terrorists uh, actions, uh, among them of Saddam Hussein, and in 2015, uh, 26th uh, June 15th by Daesh, when uh, affiliated Daesh blew up a mosque uh, in Kuwait and resulted uh, 26 innocent uh, people, and uh, of course, uh, uh, restoring peace and security in Iraq is very important and essential for the security in the region. And uh, Kuwait, of course, uh, look for stabilizing Iraq. We are standing in the same uh, distance with all uh, uh, Iraqi uh, component. And uh, we appreciate that we have chosen Kuwait to be the first destination to visit when uh, you uh, assumed your duty as the president of Iraq. Besides this, of course, we are receiving number of high level delegations, uh, we are exchanging a very uh, intensified uh, engagement. Besides this, we have the uh, ministerial commissions which uh, meet uh, politically either in Kuwait or in Baghdad. We have in Iraq three missions, the embassy in Baghdad, we have a mission consulate in Erbil, <coughs> and as well in Basra. As you remember, and everybody here in this uh, uh, August uh, gathering, we have host uh, the Iraqi uh, Reconstruction Conference uh, last uh, February, last year, 13 and 14, which resulted uh, a donation of 30 uh, uh, billion US dollar. Kuwait uh, has uh, participated in two billion, which uh, is uh, uh, announced one billion for the re. Uh, 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 for re rehabilitation the infrastructures and the other one to enhance the investments. As you can see, this kind of relation that we have in Iraq, and we appreciate it that uh, we have reached the level. I assure you that France as well is participating, and we all, of course, a uh, uh, member of the International Coalition Against Daesh. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. One last? No, no, no. I mean, no, I think I'm it, will, yeah, it so was the last. I was going to say, unfortunately, no, no. it will be the last question before concluding. Uh, I thank you, and I hope uh, I have given you an assessment uh, of the reality in our neighborhood. And I look forward to seeing many of you back home in Baghdad or uh, in the country as a whole. So you're most welcome. Come and visit. Well, Mr. President. Uh, I uh, do thank you. I think that, uh, you see, the fact that there are so many people who would have liked to, to ask you more questions shows that uh, 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 there is a regret. It's better than the other way around, by the way. When you and uh, I, let me just say that I like uh, personally your optimistic vision, even if it is very ambitious and difficult. But uh, this, I think, is absolutely necessary to have a chance to improve uh, our world, uh, especially in the Middle East. So thank you very much. Thank and you. have also a safe trip back. And now, mesdames et messieurs, vous restez assis. Ah. Gentiment. Voilà. Euh, le oui, il faut applaudir, oui, maintenant. <rires>